Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to this latest edition of Cisco Chat Live. And we have a really good uh, conversation set up for you with three experts in the area of um, the changing role of the network engineer. And we're going to be looking and discussing about how network engineering is changing due to various um, changes in the networking industry. And to help us uh, have this conversation, uh, first of all, I'd like you to meet Hank Preston. He's a distinguished engineer and uh, one of the uh, key uh, rock stars of our DevNet organization. DevNet is our developers organization here at Cisco. And uh, we just passed the 500,000 members of uh, or registered members for DevNet at Cisco Live. So that was a big um, um, uh, milestone for us uh, just recently. And uh, um, Hank is, has a master's degree in, systems, in, in information systems. Um, and he um, talks all over the world with customers about the changing role of network engineering. So thanks for joining us, Hank. Absolutely glad to be here, and I, I like it even more because you gave me a promotion. I'm actually a principal engineer, but I'll take the distinguished engineer title oh, anytime someone's willing to give it to me. So, <laughs> all right. Well, thanks for the correction. And then we have uh, Chris Groves from our Cisco IT organization, and get, I'm, I hope I get it right this time. Senior manager of network services, who's responsible for basically um, uh, the network services that we offer within Cisco um, and responsible for our software defined networking strategy, agile um, rollout of services, and also for the uh, refresh um, of our hardware inf infrastructure at Cisco. So thanks for joining us, Chris. Um, appreciate the time. Absolutely, happy, happy to be here, love the topic. Excellent, and then um, not Last, um, we have Adam Rad Radford, who is a distinguished engineer, distinguished system engineer. Um, he's out of Cisco Australia, but actually roaming uh, Europe right now, um, and has a first class degree in computer science and speaks on a regular basis with our, our customers, our uh, IT organizations, about the changing role of uh, networking. Uh, how programmability of the network is changing the role of networking. So we really have some uh, really uh, top experts here to share some good information and uh, keep those uh, questions coming through uh, Facebook Live, through uh, uh, Twitter and YouTube, etc. So we'll, step, we'll kick off with a question to Chris, um, beginning with, um, you know, and Chris, you, you always tell me that um, we're really in a golden age of, of networking right now. Things are changing. There's, there's a really big opportunity here for us to change the whole um, way that networks are designed, are operated, are run. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about, about why Cisco IT is in a situation where you need to be making such major changes? Sure, sure, absolutely. Um, I think historically, maybe for the past I don't know, decade, many IT shops have been, have been managing their networks and their upgrades, delivering a lot of value, but fairly incrementally. Um, but over that time, the expectations of what we do with the network and how people interact with the network have changed, right? There's not an IT organization I know of that doesn't have a flat or declining budget. Um, there's not an IT organization that I know of that isn't challenged all the time to move faster. We're, as consumers, we're used to mobile apps and downloading an app and it working right away and clicking a couple buttons to configure it to talk to another app. That kind of mentality is what our users expect as well on the experience side. So those three things have, have sort of changed. And to get there, I think we have to change our thinking and we've got to change, change some of our base architectures. And we're spending some time really looking hard at that um, because I do think once you get these new architectures in place, um, you're going to be with them for a while, right? You're going to make some investments. So you want to make sure you get that right. And we feel like this is sort of a year, maybe an 18-month window for us to make a, a, you know, a big change architecturally 
to really look at how we deliver services across our networks to be more in line with the, what the users are expecting, what the desired user experience is. And if we don't get that window right, whatever we have, we're, we're probably going to be we're probably going to be living with that for a while. So we want to make sure we're really careful and we can put in really good architectures where we really think about what we want the network to do, and it can be adaptable and 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 driven you know, to, to what we what we want to express is, is what we would consider our intent on the network, what we want to do. And so it is a big window of opportunity for us. And I think we have to we have to look at everything, our architectures, our staff, our organization to make that happen. And and I think, you know, as, as you were saying previously, um, this is a big opportunity um, and it needs to be done right. Right. Because the network that you're going to be transforming into this intent based network that you're um, going to be building is going to really be serving the company for the next 10 years or, or however long. So it, it's got to be done right. And in order, order to do that, what are the key things that you need to be thinking about in terms of making those, those right steps? Yeah, you know, and if we wanted to make a, a decision uh, to, to make maybe change how we do our, our transport across the WAN or, or maybe change how we're configuring devices, um, the, the old model to do that requires some spreadsheets and some analysis and some time and people sort of looking at it. And, and no one wants to, you know, our users aren't going to tolerate that kind of time. The business world doesn't tolerate that kind of delay. And so we really need to make sure we've got the data up front. So we've got to have good tooling and instrumentation into the system to know what's going on. Some of those decisions we might want to make automatically with a controller or an orchestrator. Right. If we see that there's a spike on on WAN traffic because maybe there's an event somewhere, we don't want to wait two weeks later when we get a capacity report to do something. We, we kind of want that to to go in right away. We want to have some predefined business logic that you know we've already expressed into the environment to make it make it work. Um, and we need a lot of automation because, again, with those flat and declining budgets, we're going to have less people per network device that's out there. Um, everyone comes to the office with three devices or two devices these days. So there's more and more things on the environment. Um, and we need to we really need to have a good solid platform we can write the automation against. I think uh, one of our mantras is all of our infrastructure needs to be driven by software, needs to be driven by code. And we put those all together and that, that sort of becomes a, a little feedback loop of, you know, what you want to do, the automation, the data to make sure you're doing the right thing to check that. And we need to keep iterating on that faster and faster every day as our user demand uh, increases right and uh, our users want us to do more things faster and better on on the network so i think those are the four main parts we're looking at uh, addressing sort of the data side the controller automation side the platforms the infrastructure that we can drive via code um and uh you know the ability to describe that intent in ways that make sense to our users and, and that's from an infrastructure or an architectural perspective or a technology perspective but beyond technology what are the other things that you need to be looking at yeah, so we, we're looking at, at three big areas, right? We're looking at the, the architecture and the technology, but we're also looking at um, skill sets of our engineers, uh, which I think is some of the topic for this conversation today, as well as organization. Um, and, you know, for our engineers, we're really stressing uh, software development skills. So even if the engineer is, is used to working with a command line interface for the last 10 years or something like that, um, in the future, we're not upgrading a, a box one device at a time. That's all code. That's all automation. And they need to understand how those systems work because we're, we're driving that, driving those concepts through. That's the only way we're going to be able to scale and go at the speed that our, that our clients want. Um, and then we're also looking at transformation to more agile uh, systems, right, for how we organize our projects. Waterfall's dead, right? And we're all, we're all moving to DevOps for support and different agile structures for delivery, be it a Scrum or a Kanban. And across the board, so infrastructure driven by code, we are we are running those infrastructure projects more and more like agile teams. Um, and, and that's, again, the only way we think we can get the speed and the scale we need. And then we mirror that in our organization. And I, I think I shared with this you a while back, um, you know, we have we another area we think is going to be very important for us is you know, not only the good foundational core underlays of our transport and our access and our wire and our wireless. But another big thing that we know we're going to have to do is as we connect to other enterprises or connect to other cloud providers or connect to partners, we're going to have to stitch that policy together. And so our our business intent and the logic we want to, to take place on our network has got to span all those things. So we're spending a lot of time on that. 
And so organizationally, we even have a dedicated organization looking at those service overlays, you know, giant service overlays that are connecting an acquisition to a partner, to a lab that's already in Cisco. Um, because those things, you know, that policy, that, that what we want to do, right, that's described in those, you know, very user-centric English terms, I want this lab to connect here, we've got to make that work. And we okay. need those systems to talk together and we have to tie them together with automation and data. Perfect. So technology and architecture, skill sets of the network engineers, and organization. Those are yep. the three main areas. Got it. So now let's maybe focus in on, on the skill set aspect. And Hank, I'd like to bring you in here um, to really sort of um, talk through what you're seeing. You're engaging with network engineers, with network DevOps, with developers on an ongoing daily basis. What are you seeing in terms of the current um, role of the network engineer today and how that you believe is going to change over the, over the coming, let's say, three, four years? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, and it's something that we, we talk a lot about <clears throat> with the different engineers that were out there at, at events and talking with customers. The, the network engineer traditionally has been focused on building a network and a transport that would support the business applications that ran over the top of it. Um, but the network was kind of treated as this piece that was just there and, and kind of ships in the night as they went through. Having more understanding of what's running on top of the network, what the applications need, um, how they operate, the requirements that they have are driving skills into the network engineers kind of tool bag that we've always had kind of we've talked about them, but we didn't necessarily focus in on them. So as an example, applications today are driven by APIs and, and REST structures and, and areas that are there. And what we're finding is that engineers, network engineers more than anything else, have to understand how the HTTP protocol really works. Like what makes these applications tick so that we can better troubleshoot them. And then to actually be able to, to keep up with the demand of the new applications that go through, in addition to core layer two and three fundamentals, we have to be able to understand uh, programming logic, uh, syntax inside of languages the ways to deploy our infrastructure using automation techniques that are different from just kind of copying and pasting out of Notepad at 3 a.m. And we really have to build in these new, these new structures into the way that we go after it. And it's driving a lot of new fundamental skills for network engineers. And they're needing to go back and kind of learn some of those things from scratch. Great. And we, we actually have a, um, a question from Ibukun on YouTube. I hope, hope I... Um, said that name correctly. Um, and he, he's actually asking, um, how can I start a network engineering career? Now, um, I think, um, you know, having said what you just said, do you, do you start with um, the same CCIE um, or CCNA um, certification? Or is there a different path today to uh, network engineering? Is, is there a different insertion point there? Yeah, that's a fantastic question, and it's one I get all the time. And I get it so often that I actually wrote a blog post on how do I get started in network programmability to bring together the general recommendations that come through. And, and the short version is recognizing that building a network in the future in a programmable fashion is still building networks. And so the, the traditional model of learning about networking through the, the CCNA program, picking up the fundamentals of layer two and subnetting and IP space, we still need those. But along with that, we have to kind of bolt on and kind of work in skill sets like fundamentals around programming concepts. And today there's no better language and, and mechanism for a network engineer to get involved with than to take a look in, at Python fundamentals and basics. And so what I usually tell folks is bounce back and forth, do a little bit of networking focused um, areas, maybe go get your CCNA and then go take a, a, an intro to Python class and learn how that goes through. And then jump back into some more networking and then maybe pick up some Linux fundamentals because that's becoming a really important element of the network engineer as well. And it's this, this balanced approach to skilling yourself up is important for anybody coming in. Because if you're too deep in one area, um, you lack context to do the job in the future. And so that's that general kind of broad stroke approach is what I usually recommend folks. Fantastic. Thanks, Hank. And Adam, you, you're speaking to network engineers that are already well along in their careers on a daily basis. Um, and when you're talking to them about picking up these programming skills, Python, uh, RESTCon, et cetera, um, 
what um what what are your, the responses that you're seeing? Are there different responses um, that you're seeing <laughs> from different customers? Is that uh, is that the case? Yeah. Yeah, so it's interesting. I mean, um, the last few years I've, I've noticed with great interest that the change in people's attitudes towards programmability and automation. And the way I, I sort of look at it is that, I don't know if you've ever heard of the, the five phases of grieving when there's something that happens to you that you don't necessarily want to happen. You, know, you go through the denial phase, you know, no, network automation is never going to happen. You go through the angry phase where we're sick of this network automation, it's terrible. You go through the bargaining phase where, well, maybe if we do a little bit of network automation, we'll be okay. You go through depression where you think I need a new career and then finally you reach acceptance where you embrace it. And, you know, I look at and I see people in all five phases of this, this approach. And I guess what I, I would notice in the last uh, year or so, in the last six months in particular, is that people are moving far faster through those phases towards acceptance. And are you, are you not finding that there's a phase where people are, like, absolutely thrilled with the, the changes that are happening because it's going to change the way that network engineers yeah. do their job and, yeah. and actually maybe yeah, absolutely. You know, turn, turn it into a more creative? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and yeah, there's, there's two schools of thought here, right? There's one where people resist change and it's change that's done to them. The other camp is the camp that embrace change and are actually seeking to, to go out and make change. And I think there's a large proportion of the, the network engineer community that is quite excited about this. I mean, networking hasn't really changed much in the last 15, 20 years. So for them, this is an opportunity to acquire new skills, to to learn again, which is why, why they got into networking often in the first place was that it was new, there was always new protocols, there was always new things to learn. So yeah, there, there are those two camps. Um, and yeah, I see that, that there's another group that is, is absolutely embracing this. And just to, out of interest, what do you think are the biggest um, perceptions or maybe misconceptions, misperceptions about the change that's happening? What, where do you think, um, you know, when you speak to network engineers typically, um, what are their perceptions of this change? And, and maybe do you think they're yep. seeing this in, the, in, in a way that isn't quite correct? Yeah, so a lot of the resistance comes from the fear that they're going to lose their job. So the, the people who are trying, who are resistant to this change think that the moment that I have automation, it means that I'm no longer required. But as Hank rightly pointed out, I mean, core networking fundamentals is still a, a key requirement here. Just because you can automate doesn't mean you're going to do the right thing. I mean, I remember when I was a kid, my, my father used to tell me that a, a fool with a tool is still a fool. So network automation is a tool and it allows you to do things more efficiently, but if you do the wrong thing, you can also do that more efficiently as well. I think I'd add to that and say that if you do the wrong thing, you actually cause harm, right? I mean, you can, you can really yeah. wreak some havoc <laughs> on your systems, especially if we look at automatic feedback loops, right? If you're not knowing what's going on yeah. under the covers, you can really mess some things up. Cascading, cascading yeah. problems. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and just because you're automating stuff, it doesn't mean that you don't don't need to understand in really exactly. good detail what you're exact what you're doing. Yeah. Absolutely. And the example I use there is my background is software. So I'm a software engineer. My training was in software. And when I learned to program, I programmed in assembler code. Now, assembler code is really low level. It's it's a really fundamental way of interacting with a, a computer. It's very powerful. And, you know, nobody programs in assembly language anymore. We use higher order programming languages. We use compilers and other tools to, to make it more efficient to execute code. Now, the way I think about network automation is that the CLI is essentially the assembly language of networking. So what we're trying to do is to provide higher order programming language, higher order tools to allow you to interact with those same network fundamentals. But at the end of the day, just in the software world, it's still important that you understand software engineering and software engineering concepts in order to take advantage of these new tools that are available. But I, I can understand that sort of reluctance to let go of it because um, you have such control with Assembler, right? You have such a, yep. a power with Assembler to, to really um, make changes in a way that you want to make those changes. 
But having said that, it's it's not efficient and it's not effective anymore. And there are new tools that we need to be able to adopt and embrace. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. so Chris, um, if you're you know looking at the way that uh, Adam maybe laid out the different ways that uh, IT organizations are responding to this change, what, what's Cisco IT doing? How are you actually embracing this change and and you know helping network engineers within your, within the organization to really embrace this change? And I think there's a couple of messages we we drive across. One, you know, he mentioned the the grief and the and, you know, embrace the change. So some of our engineers embrace the change, and that's fantastic because they've realized that this is a force multiplier for them, right? It's not, you know, if, if they are given the, the job of upgrading a switch, that's one fine. If they're given the job of upgrading 500 switches, that's six months of their life if they're doing CLI. And But if they can script it and they can use the tools to automate it, that's a weekend, right, or an evening. So some of them embrace it and, and they catch that. The others that are a little bit more resistant, you know, they, they fall into a couple of different categories. And what we generally try to remind them is that, um, you know, this is all about speed and that's the force multiplier here there is a fear a fear factor of this right like oh that i think that was the was it the fourth phase or something like that right the oh my god i need to retool myself right but it's really all about speed right because that's what we really need to to react on and that's something that tends to resonate a lot with our engineers when they get it and they say oh this is actually going to take some tedious task away from me right and i don't have to do it a hundred times they start to catch on and then I also like to remind them, you know, if they look around, this has happened to every other piece of IT for the most part. It's happened to software engineers. It's happened to sysadmins. It's happened for, for DBAs. All of us have had to up-level our game. You still need a strong DBA who knows how to do your indexing when it gets right down there and you've got a squirrely problem. But now you can, you know, you've got 100 of databases that you can take a look at now with some automated tools to help you get the generic stuff done. And that's really what you want to do. So we're, you know, we're looking at it a force multiplier for our, for our, our engineers and, and by and large it has been pretty successful. So we've, you know, we've gone through um, an extensive training program for all of ours and all of them have, um, to, to Hank's point, all of them have had some amount of Python or Perl or NSO training either already or we'll have it by the end of this year. I think we got about 75% that have had some training already and we make them do a we make them do an automation project they may not go back and do automation projects for the rest you know for the rest of the year but we make them deliver one in an agile way so that they can see the value and that's been really successful for them to sort of realize oh this means i get friday nights back or oh this means you know i'm i'm not working every weekend from here until eternity because that's the only time we have change windows um so it's, it's been really successful in helping highlight that wonderful that that's that's great insights chris and we have another question from uh, Stefano on, on YouTube around how Cisco is helping customers or helping uh, network engineers move towards these um, types of capabilities, these new certification paths. Hank, could you give us maybe a little bit of insights into what are some of the things that we're um, putting in place to help um, customers move along this journey? Yeah, I would love to take that because that's actually the, the the big driving reason that brought me to join the DevNet team about a year and a half ago was because I saw this transition from network engineering coming at us and this need for new skills, uh, new capabilities, raw knowledge, and I wanted to help my fellow network engineers make this transition. And so inside of DevNet, what we've been doing a lot is building a foundation of material to help uh, engineers skill up. And so we offer resources across the board from on-demand um, education uh, capabilities through our Learning Labs platform, where anybody can log in and walk through self-guided labs on, on classes like Python 101 or the fundamentals of Git, all the way up through some of the new interfaces and learning about model-driven programmability and the NetConf Yang standards or the APIs on a specific platform like DNA Center. And so we've got all of this on-demand free resources that are available. We've got uh, sandboxes offered by DevNet so that if you don't have the infrastructure necessary to explore some of these technologies, we'll use ours. And we have a sandbox engineering team that build and manage uh, development sandboxes made up of both Cisco as well as third party software and hardware so that you can go in and, and experiment with some of the things you've learned in a learning lab. You can look through those. Um, we also do the on-site elements, and so we Cisco Lives around the world. We've got DevNet zones that you can come in and spend time with our experts, like Adam has been teaching classes in DevNet zone for 
I think from the very beginning. Um, and if you can't get to a Cisco Live, we'll keep your eyes open for DevNet Express, where we're bringing on-demand uh, training with hands-on exercises globally. And we're running these uh, in countries around the world and time zones all over the place with, with experts from DevNet and Worldwide SE to bring it out there. Um, we are focused really hard at trying to make it much easier for network engineers to make this transition than if you didn't have the resources available. So be sure to kind of keep your ears open, follow on social media, look at our events page, and then definitely bookmark sites like Learning Labs and the DevNet site to figure out what's available to help you make this transition. Because if there's one thing I want everybody to recognize is you're not alone, and there's a community of folks willing and able and ready to help you make this transition. Wonderful. And we, we have a really good question here from uh, Deepak on Twitter. Um, what is the future of the network engineer? And I, I think we've covered aspects of that, but I think it, um, you know, it would be good to reiterate what is, you know, in 2022, what is the network engineer's role going to be? Um, you know, maybe the day in the life of a network engineer in 2022, as opposed to the day in the life of a network engineer today. Anyone want to take a first uh, crack at that one? Adam, go for it. <laughs> Um, I reckon it'll be a, a, a wonderful job in 2022. I reckon I'll be at the beach most days, um, just <laughs> waiting for alerts coming in, telling me that the uh, the network is self healed and and is self aware and and uh, sorted itself out and solved 15 problems itself today. Saved me an awful lot of time. No, seriously, All I right. think um, the the, <laughs> the role of the network engineer in in the next few years is is going. Move towards software, obviously, is um, APIs and integration is going to move towards um, analytics and understanding and gleaning information from the network, given the, the vast amounts of uh, telemetry information that the network has access to. So I think there's some very interesting things coming in terms of the, the role of the network engineer and how they take advantage of that. Uh, things such as machine learning, um, things such as security and automated security become very interesting. Um, things such as integration via APIs into other systems that exist. So closed loop uh, remediation of issues. There's a whole range of, of interesting possibilities in, in 2022. Wonderful. I think, I don't think you're wrong on the beach thing. And I can say, you know, as an IT manager of a network operations team, what I hope is different is in 2022, instead of having one of my engineers call me and say, hey, Chris, there's a, a bridge going on, there's an escalation, there's an urgent thing, we need to make this change or we got to do this, instead I'll get some sort of email notification or something in a collab room or a text message that says, hey, the, you know, there's twice as many people at this site, so we made this change so that it's working now, or, or there was a problem and it automatically failed over and did the, you know, I, I, I hope to get that message and not an engineer calling me and telling me they need to go touch something or do something. And I think my engineers who aren't, you know, because we don't have engineers at every location, and when a problem comes up, I expect that engineer to have some guided help to fix it if they actually do have to touch it. I expect them to get something that's integrated with their service management system that says, here's a problem, maybe the link straight to the controller or the device analytics that pulls out all the data if we actually need someone to look at it, because you may still need to have someone actually look at it. But I expect it to be assisted and you know, have lots of additional relevant information given to them. You may be using some AI processing or something, right? Um, and I expect for when people come to you know, put a device on the network or need a particular service, they're gonna go out to some sort of store, app store and say, I wanna connect my new whiz bang device and I need it to talk to that and they're gonna hit some buttons and they're not gonna care what happens underneath the covers and it's gonna work. And that's the way I hope it is in 2020. Um, and the network engineer is the one that wrote that, and maybe they're at the beach. So I'll, I'll throw in a couple of visions there. I think all of that is completely accurate. Uh, the thing that I'm looking the most forward to is the network engineer of the 2020 being confident and being excited about being a network engineer, knowing that they, they took a lot of work to get there, um, but they have the tools necessary, they've got the support, and they they're continue to be seen as a critical part of the technology team supporting their digital businesses. 
one of the things that, that just breaks my heart when I get out there is I see network engineers that, that are frustrated and concerned that they picked the wrong job in an industry. And I want that to go away. I want the network engineer of 2022, I guess that's the year we picked, to be a proud person, well-skilled and well-capable to take them into 2032 and, and, and beyond. I love it. I love it. And, and I think there's also that sort of um, concept of moving from sort of operations to innovation, right? That concept of how, and, and we, we just saw it at, at Cisco Live. We had um, 15 partners at Cisco Live building solutions on top of um, the DNA center in Tempe's networking controller. Um, and it was really exciting to see these different types of solutions that they created. And it, it, there was a lot of creative creativity behind that. And in fact, Chris, I think, um, you know, Cisco IT did something really exciting themselves. Could maybe just give a little bit of insight into what Cisco IT built on top of DNA Center, just as an example of sort of the innovation that can be um, created on, on, on top of these platforms. Yeah, we, we did a we had a demo at one of the IT management sessions, which is online. I'm not sure exactly what the title of it was, but you could probably download it from the Cisco Live uh, website. And during the demo, I, my senior vice president and another one of the directors in the collab space, um, they started the conversation off talking about integrations and the power of doing that. And uh, the collab senior director went out to DNA Center clicked a button to say, approve this version of code, release this version of code and upgrade a, upgrade a switch, right? And we had automation going on on the back end that created a service ticket in the ServiceNow system, an actual change record. We, and for the demo, we, we did it much faster, right? We didn't go through the approval process. And then it kicked off the device installation. And then they left it and they walked away and they talked for 15 minutes and they came back and they checked 15 minutes later. And uh, the device has been upgraded by DNAC and through the integration with ServiceNow, um, the change record was closed and all the notifications about the change record and the communication and the steps that were going on as part of the upgrade were included in a, in a WebEx team space. And that's the kind of stuff that I expect that we'll see more of in the future. And officially now the collaboration uh, senior director has upgraded more 4,500 switches with DNA Center than I have. And I'm a little embarrassed by that, but very proud of her and very proud that the, the demo worked. Okay, fantastic. So what I would like to do is um, start wrapping it up um, and really just put it out there to, because we, we're getting some questions here about what uh, Cisco certification should I do? What is the future of uh, network engineering, et cetera? So I'd just like to sort of wrap it up and ask the three of you, what advice would you be giving to um, a budding new network engineer or someone that's looking at um, network engineering as a career path for the future? What advice would you give them in terms of um, what steps to take? Who's going to start? Sure. I'll, I'll go first. Okay. Um, I think that it's interesting in terms of a the, the changes that are occurring. So if you're looking at, I think the, the fundamental question or point I would make is that core networking skills are important, but that's a foundation for the new automation skills. I think I would be careful about perfection paralysis around automation and the new skills. So if you can't automate everything, then you think you shouldn't automate anything. So just be careful about over or looking for perfection. Start small, controlled in a safe environment for learning. And the other point I would make is it's okay the first time that it takes longer to do it in an automated way than it might have by hand. It's a new skill that you're acquiring. It's just like learning to surf or learning to, skill for the, to ski for the first time. The first few weeks are challenging. It will take longer potentially initially, but you'll reap the benefits longer term. Okay, great, Adam. Thank you. Hank. Yeah. I'll jump in and kind of build on that. And I think Adam's points are spot on. Um, every time I've taught a class on something, there's someone in the room that'll always say, God, it's faster if I just do that the old way. Why can't I just do it the old way? And the truth is it is faster the old way the first time. Um, but don't but don't stop there, right? It's a, it's a hockey stick effect. So keep at it and go after it. And then there was a question that came in that I saw to the corner of my eye about how do you keep up with everything? And I get that one a lot too. And don't try to keep up. If you feel like you need to understand every new idea or tool or piece that's out there, you're going to get frustrated and, and continue down that angry path and just 
despair. Recognize that it's okay not to know everything, but pick something and that excites you and interests you and figure out where it leads you and just build on your skill set from that. Before you know it, you'll be three months down the road and making things so much better than they were before, but you just kind of got to dive in and go after it and see where it leads you. All right, lovely. So I think we'll, I think we'll wrap up there. And uh, I definitely urge um, all of our listeners on, on the various channels to take a look at DevNet. And uh, if you go into um, what Hank was referring to, um, cisco.com, um, oh, sorry, developer.cisco.com, slash DNA Center, you'll get access to all of the APIs, the SDKs, the training, the sandboxes, etc. And to learn more about intent-based networking, um, cisco.com slash go slash DNA Center. Um, that's uh, our platform for intent-based networking within the enterprise. And you'll find a, a wealth of information about how the network is evolving to this more software-delivered um, intent-based approach. So thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. I hope this was of uh, use and of uh, value to you. And uh, we'll see you at the next Cisco chat. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jonathan.